We shall we will begin in one minute. Cody has got on strong cutters on the bus's team. Now, Kate Nay does a chato, my disguise does an ella. I'm actually from Loop, but I work in Denver, Colorado. Sonia Begay, uh, she works with the office of the vice office of the president and vice president, and she'll do a brief um, overview of the app. Sonia. Thank you, Thomas, and uh, yeah. uh, welcome everyone to today's fourth installment of the Fireside Conversations on Trauma, Resiliency, and Hope. We thank you for joining us today, and we're looking forward to um, this last session. On the screen, you see a, an um, information on our mobile app. This is from the Navajo Nation Office of the First Lady and Second Lady. We encourage you all to download the app. You will see a QR code. You may hold your mobile phone camera up to the screen and it will provide you with the link to where you will be able to download the app. Um, it is available on the Apple Store as well as the Google Play Store. So, um, Again, we encourage you to download the app, stay connected with our office. We send out a lot of information, community events. We link our videos, so you may um, access all that information there. And so um, thank you again for joining us today. the last session of the fireside conversation about trauma, resiliency, hope, hosted by the Navajo Nation Office of the First Lady and Second Lady. Today is going to be a good one because we talk about faith, belief, and hope. Thank you for taking the time to learn about trauma, resiliency, and hope in this, in this series. We have covered a lot, of, about a, a lot of information excuse me, in the last three series. If you can make it or use and miss any of the sessions, all the sessions are recorded in the, for future viewing. They can be found on the office of the first lady and second lady app. In need Sonia, Sonia Yahoo's name, the app is Niki, a the Akunae recording Niki Kunae Sando let a call. Eat eight at the Nish in the Skank or the Akwaeg, not at the Northeast. I want to let you know that all these series have well be done in English. Abba Laganak, Achite, Shitakwil Net or Lesh, Ajashi, Saishi, the Netherdot. Did <laughs> Uh, the second lady, the second 
the second lady gets dirty lies or a nah nizor go a so the nahaya had to watch the second lady lies or yes hello everybody and hello to our panelists and those of you who are watching when from the OPVP communications YouTube channel. Appreciate you being here and you know we're excited for our fourth day and final session, uh, which is on faith, belief, and hope. And you know, I just want to share a scripture before I uh, pray, um, say a prayer for our session here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who have mourned that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. And that's found in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Um, so I'll um, begin with a prayer. Father God, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day you've given us, Lord God. Thank you for the moisture and thank you, Lord, that we can all come together um, today and, and talk about faith and hope and belief, Lord God, and where we all lie in our belief. And Lord, um, we just look to you and, and all that we do and all that we go through and all that we feel, Father God. We, um, as humans, we all have feelings, Father God. And Lord, sometimes we don't know how to voice or how what to say or where to go. But Father, we have our professionals that are here, our leaders that are here to help us and guide us through those times of hurt and all the traumas that we as individuals go through. And I know, Father God, a lot of our Diné people, our brothers and sisters have gone through much um, trials and tribulations. And, and Lord, we just pray that we can have an outlet, Father God, a good outlet. And whether that's um, being um, in prayer or uh, studying the word or going out to for a run or um, father just talking to another uh, person about the, the things that we go through father we just uh, pray father that um, this session um, will be helpful for those out there who are struggling father and and lord and at this time of during the pandemic we know many out there are struggling having to be isolated having to be alone and all the fear that has overcome them lord god for we know in your word it says that we are not to fear but to have the love and the power and that sound mind lord in your word that we need to have sound mind and father god i lord I pray, Lord, that um, we can all have that, Lord God, and look to you and all that we do. And Lord, just um, open the ears and um, Father God, take off the scales off, off of our eyes so we can hear and listen to what our leaders um, can help us through and to um, lead us through, Father God. And Lord, we thank you for the time. I pray blessings upon them. I pray, Father God, that you um, would continue um, your protection over um, the people, Father God. And and Lord, we know that there are so many, Father, that um, don't know where to turn. But Father, we, um, those of those of us who have that faith and that hope, that we pray that our people will come through this and we will come through strong. And Lord, we thank you. And we praise you this day. In Jesus' name, I pray. We pray. Amen. Amen. It's a second lady. Um, she needed to have a scene that needed to not a scene. She Thomas Cody once yet has gone to the front of the Sunday, but she's seen on that kind of night. Does she don't mind this? Excuse you, does she know? Although, um, director should not know in Austin's name, um, Denver, Colorado. Uh, so I work as a, uh, a director in for Casey Family Programs in Denver, Colorado. So the Casey Family Programs, a, it's an operating foundation. Um, it's we're located in Denver, Colorado, and our headquarters is in Seattle, Washington. Casey Family Programs is the nation's largest operating foundation, focusing on safety reduction, reducing the need for foster care in the United States. Our mission is to provide and improve and ultimately prevent the need for foster care. We are committed to building communities of hope, a nationwide effort to prevent the need for foster care by supporting families in raising safe, happy, and healthy children. Look for us on the website at www.kc.org. Casey Family Program is happy to have the 
the National Native Children's Trauma Center at the University of Montana joined us as our presenters for this series. It is, it, it be such a pleasure that you parted with us. I also want to send a special thank you to the office, the first lady, the second lady and your staff. We get a lot of work done, work done working together. You are, you are both doing such a great job trying to figure out how to improve the importance and relevance of information to the Navajo people about prevention, family and healing. Today, we will continue to learn about the impact of trauma within tribal families and communities within our, with our presenters from the National Center, <clears throat> the National Native Children Trauma Center at the University of Montana. They will introduce themselves shortly. I'm very excited that they are here together. So we will learn about faith, belief, and hope. What does this look for? For this, what does this look for? What does this look for the Navajo people? To set the, to set the context, I would like to give some time to our first, la first uh, Navajo Nation First Lady, Philia Nez Shadeja. We will also hear from Second Lady Dottie Lizer. First Lady. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, big mountain day, uh, um, welcome to the final installment of our fireside uh, conversations on trauma, resiliency, and hope. Um, this, this series where, um, you know, we did this, we brought this to you in partnership with the, with Casey Family Programs and the National Native Children's Trauma Center. Thank you so much for partnering with us. This is very uh, important information that we are that you're all bringing forth to the Navajo Nation. So this is our fourth session. Um, this set, you know session one um, focused on historical and generational trauma. Ses session two was the impacts of trauma, and then session session three was building resilience. And today the focus will be on faith, belief, and hope. So. And if you missed any sessions or would like to rewatch any of the previous sessions, you may access the recordings on the Navajo Nation OPVP communications channel uh, on YouTube. Uh, all recorded webinars and conferences are also posted there for viewing. So those of you who enjoy um, and want to watch any of our virtual events um, from Office of First Lady and Second Lady, you're welcome to go to YouTube and go to Navajo Nation OPVP communications. So. Um, Office of First Lady and Second Lady, we focused on building and fostering healthy families. This includes the home environment, parenting, marriage, lifelong education, faith and cultural well-being, and holistic healing and restoration of individual and family units. And so, you know, I, I always say, you know, everything that um, happens in our home is a microcosm of the bigger you know, our bigger, larger environments and our communities, our tribal nations and everything else that extends from there, our, you know, our federal government as well. So, and it's so important to focus on the home and the family. I work a lot with early childhood education professionals, early childhood mental health professionals. And then of course, with the work that I do with missing and murdered indigenous um, peoples, you know, there's a link between, um, the development of the growing child from conception to through childhood and the environment that they grow in, what they're exposed to, you know, it, it, it does impact them. But on the other hand, we also know that early interventions, um, you know, and within the context of our tribal nations, it's the kinship systems. It's some of the, those indigenous knowledge and systems that we've carried on for or from generations back to now, you know, those really do kindle restoration and healing. And so I always um, encourage and support, you know, you put in Western knowledge and then you have to always pair in um, our own indigenous knowledge and ways and practices as well. So thank you again. And as uh, Thomas said, Hard 
National Native Children's Trauma Center. Aro Casey Family Programs de isto mekon an an he an he nito nagago Thomas Cody aro Melissa Clyde A A Casey Family Programs de nas nisto ade isto niki ka na nche eko kat e gokshin kadon ka da is nato le eko ahi ha na na and then from our office of First Lady and Second Lady we we like to share information resources and community events on our mobile app. In that app, you can download from the Apple Store or, or Google Play Store. Um, we encourage you to download our app to stay connected with our office and be informed of other events we host. And for that, you would just search for our Office of First Lady, Napa Nation Office of First Lady, Second Lady. And so through this series, information was shared that families can utilize and incorporate into their own lives. We hope these sessions will allow you to begin the conversations as a family in your homes. Although, <laughs> Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a desert. Um, first lady, uh, Connery, second lady, Nando Stadilizer. Yes, hello, everyone. Again, um, um, you know, earlier I, I led with the um, a scripture that says that He, God, will bring us comfort and He'll bring comfort to the brokenhearted. You know, every, every one of us is um, created. For value, we're created for purpose, and you know sometimes those get misconstrued when there's trauma involved. And so, you know, me as um, as a person of faith, you know, we, you know, we as a believer need to follow God's mandate, you know, and to be there for those who, um, you know, go through things in our lives. Um, you know, we need to care for those um, who are oppressed. We need to um, be th there for those who are vulnerable, who are exploited. And, uh, you know, we just, um, uh, you know, can't say enough on how much hope we have in, in Christ, how much hope we have in the word and, you know, the, the faith that we have in the word. It says that we, um, we all have faith and you know, a mustard seed is so small and we can have faith as small as a mustard seed. And if we have that faith as a mustard seed, we can move mountains. We can do things that we don't think we can do. And uh, so, um, you know, and of course, we always have a belief and hope. We can hope that our, um, you know, we can get through these times of, you um, tribulation in times of trials, we have that hope. And, and I think, um, you know, the best agency to change is simply right here. Simply, you know, you, you can make that change. You know, um, it's looking within yourself to make those changes. And it all starts right here, right there. It begins with you. And, um, you know, and we need to wake up. We need to wake up and rise up to help our people. You know, we have a lot of um, professionals here today to help us in those things and help us get through um, times of unknown, times of fear. I just received a phone call from one of my employees 10 minutes ago, literally, and he 
had just come down. He he had just had COVID and he was probably like three weeks removed from it. And the fear in his voice, you know, I only thing I could tell him to do was take a breath, slow down, slow down your breathing, and let's take it one step at a time. And that's all we can do sometimes is just take it one step at a time when we go through, you know, trauma and, and the things in our lives that we bring to. Um, yesterday was a, a good example of, you know, what we learned from, you know, our ancestors and how it's, you know, come now to us, you know, and there was a good uh, discussion on um, Dr. Yellowman. She talked about diabetes, how her you know, um, great grandfather had it. And so in, in where it came from and how now it's in her family and, uh, you know, and how do we get past that? And that's why I was saying it all begins right here. And, uh, so we, you know, we all need to wake up. We all need to, you know, look to the professionals that have studied a lot of these things. And so we, you know, just thank them for being here today and being a part of this. Um, you know, cause that's sometimes just what our, our people need to hear is just the hope. And, um, you know, what, you know, what can we do? You know, sometimes all we have is, is prayer, you know, that's the first and fourth. The first thing we need to do is just come to, you know, our knees and pray and, you know, with, with prayer, you know, anything is possible, you know, and, and sometimes that helps us um, get through these things and, you know, pray that God gives us the, the eyes to see, you know, the ears to hear, you know, how to interact with, you know, maybe, you know, our, our counselor or, or somebody that we're talking to, because we need to be open, we need to be open to that. But at the same time, you know, to be able to trust in someone. And uh, so we just want to um, thank you for being a part of this, uh, our fourth series, uh, our last and final series, um, you know, um, faith, hope, and belief. And um, so I, I, I appreciate every one of you being here. Um, uh, Kimmy and Dr. Zimmerman and uh, Mr. Cody and uh, Veronica DeCrane, um, First Lady, Sonia, Eli, thank you for, for Eli. We wouldn't be here without Eli, right? And uh, Dr. Branzer. So we appreciate every one of you. And um, you know, and for just the partnerships that we have with uh, KC Family uh, Programs and also the University of Montana's Nation Natives Children's Trauma Center. So we appreciate them and all that they do and, you know, everything that they're bringing to this uh, series. So, yeah, and, uh, you know, earlier I didn't um, introduce myself correctly. So, she'e dari lizer yinishe kia ani initially. My eight excuse me, but teen. But dot need a should say, Kachi need a Chanel. I am local here. I am from the St. Michael's area. So I, you know, grew up here and live here in, in Winter Rock right now. And so I'm um, very happy to be here. Thank you. Sonia, I believe Dr. Branzer is going to share her, share the screen. Yes. Oh, you're on mute, Thomas. Shaha, um, First Lady Nair, Second Lady Liza Yego, we caught nine of Chow Eko to hold just did the Nanny Glenigi Ado, the Dahoits, Kizibit Taho, the Hois Ago, to eight to an Hide, D. Nal Kiri, that the Nosh is the eight to its other in the Hidos Ah, so a Shaha, uh, Sudeja, Perfilia, and Ms. Lizer, thank you for taking the initiative to advocate for not only our Navajo people, but uh, Native people across the nation who will be viewing these series. Uh, before we launch the series, we'll be mindful that we would like to share the resources and information about services that are available to support and help. The information is provided by the Navajo Division of Behavioral and Mental Health Services, Navajo Department of Health, Dr.
All right. Hello, Yad. Hopefully you can see me now and you can see the screen that I am sharing. Uh, so yes, yeah, Yad A from Division of Behavioral and Mental Health Services. She'e uh, Michelle Branzer or Dr. Branzer Yanishia. Um, my clans Nash Eja Nishli Tobajni Aji Bashishin Twitter Chini Dasha Che Aro Kayaani Dasha Nele. I come from uh, Pinedale, Tobo Huizbenas, near Gallup, Nana Georgia, and uh, trained uh, <laughs> clinically as a uh, clinical mental health counselor, as well as a substance abuse counselor, and uh, definitely enjoy what I do, but just wanted to share, take some time to share the resources across our, our great nation. Uh, the Department of Health is the website I am showing right now, and some of you may have visited before. And so you can see uh, we've really doing a lot of work of trying to bridge our resources together. As you know, Indian Health Services is also across Navajo Nation, as well as our 638 healthcare corporations and other tribal programs that were all tasked uh, to assist during this time of the pandemic. So I just wanna show how to navigate to the resources Courses. Um, if you have a device, whatever device you can use that. And then once you get there, you can also print the resource booklet or uh, pages that you would want to, to help you with resources. So as you can see, uh, the tabs here, you see COVID-19 is the tab. And you're gonna go down to, and it says mental health resources, kind of towards the middle of the page. Click on it. And this is what it should look like when you pop up. Uh, we do list the national helplines as well as certain populations. Veterans is on here. Nowadays, uh, especially for some of our folks who like texting, there are crisis lines just for texting. So you can get on there and uh, somebody is available to respond at that time. For Navajo Nation within Division of Behavioral and Mental Health Services, we have 11 treatment center sites across Navajo, and here you can see them. And with that, we do have um, individuals that have phones um, to after hours even to make sure that we can um, reach that. But I know sometimes like even people that are calling, you know, have difficulty with self-service. So uh, I keep trying in other words, if uh, for some reason it, the phone isn't working well. And then down here, you'll see the other resources we've included with Indian Health Services. Uh, you'll see the IHS for drugs and alcohol, Navajo Treatment Center for Families. So we tried to put some key um, programs and agencies in here. And this research guy, resource guide, I'm sorry, that we uh, collaborated on, it was really a work of every one of us seeing the need for people to have a way to reach out when they're in crisis or even not when they're in crisis and they're just feeling like there's no one to talk to, uh, to be able to uh, offer those uh, connections through all of our different agencies. And here is the state resources really quickly. And also this is where I'm saying you can download the resource guide and this is where I'm gonna click on it and you can see it's pulling up. So you'll see our great seal and then just highlighting again, um, because there's different service sites even within IHS, if you're at a state and you're trying to help your loved one or vice versa, you're trying to help someone on the nation that maybe doesn't live next to you, you, know, you can see the numbers here, uh, the individuals. And if they're not there, typically, you know, you can ask for that next person that you can speak to. So let's say for Crown Point, you know, that they're listed here at the IHS facility. Uh, here is their phone number. If you don't get to speak to the supervisor, there is someone, um, receptionist, these are the normal business hours though. And in the red is where we have our sets for the 638 healthcare um, organizations that we have too. And so I'm just hoping I don't go too fast, but really it, it lists, it's an extensive list and we'll continue to update because I know there's some things that need to be updated in here. The next one is we do have medical social services and during this time of the pandemic, 
uh, if you've had family members that uh, were receiving case management, many times uh, the IHS facilities where our even 638s have public health nurses that are responding to help, you know, make connections if you need more assistance. Uh, and so these are the numbers, these are the different agencies again throughout Navajo. And I'm just gonna kind of breeze through that again. This next one here is IHS does have some um, workers that work with drugs and alcohol as well as um, you know, more uh, referral based as well. And we at DBMHS are also tasked, um, that's our main scope of work to work with drugs and alcohol treatment outpatient, which means person does not uh, stay at the facility. They're being um, asked to schedule time with a counselor or group sessions uh, to be able to find ways to support not using drugs and alcohol. And so these are some of the facilities. Okay. This next one here, um, I do wanna point out Utah, uh, you know, they are really doing a great job themselves. Uh, it's really Northern part of the nation and Rick Handy is a great resource. So those of you who do have loved ones or yourself live in Utah, uh, they are a good resource even to help um, make sure that, you know, needs are being met that, that are known. Of course, with Navajo Nation, we have uh, under the Department of Health Social Services, and in here we listed the Navajo Treatment Center for Children and their families. Again, this is an area that um, you know we always want to be mindful for for our children, for the families, to make sure that we can um, pass along the resources because you know, in, in many ways, some people uh, are wearing multiple hats at these different agencies. But please be mindful there there are people there to assist you, um, and the numbers are listed here as well. And then I'm on to show DBMHS. Again, we have our central office. That's where I'm sitting from in Winter Rock and Admin 2. And then we have a prevention program within that. And some of you may have seen their uh, presentations. Uh, a lot of it is um, basically related to the needs that um, have come forth or been requested, as well as sometimes certain months have certain themes uh, that we wanna try to um, capture. One of them would have been mental health awareness uh, back in December and, you know, Native American, um, you know, celebrations and awareness. So the resources for the prevention section or outreach section is, is very plentiful. Uh, they're usually on Facebook Live, and some of you may have seen those as well. And then going on, we list the sites by the states. So in Arizona is first. And then we go into the uh, New Mexico side. And in the red, this is where you'll find the mental health helplines that were listed prior all by themselves on that first page. But this is just letting you know that these are the line numbers you need to call and someone can assist you in that manner. So this next one here, we know are doing a lot of work during this time of the pandemic is our uh, community health representatives, CHRs. And they are doing a lot of um, checking in on individuals making sure that uh, if deliveries need to be made, this is also in conjunction with the health uh, command center, the operation center, that you know, we wanna work together to make sure that the needs are being met out there for our relatives. We do list also our police departments, fire departments, the Navajo Nation fire departments as well. Uh, again, uh, sometimes they are also needed at certain crisis instances. This next one will list uh, more resource again for mental health. And some of them are in you know, the more national phone lines. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, I would say the, the response I'm getting is that they are really, really helpful. Um, however, again, these aren't usually individuals who are in or on Navajo. So um, just reaching out to them is just a way to offer another support. Also for domestic violence. And these ones are particular by state. Uh, you may have known uh, Resilient Arizona is also one that's offering crisis counseling during the pandemic in Arizona. New Mexico also has their crisis line as well. And for this one, last couple of resources I'll share that are on here is safety plan. Now safety plan is for someone who's uh, really in dire need 
meaning they want to hurt themselves or they want to hurt someone else or you know they are just in a huge state of crisis and don't see ways out of that. So this is typically can be done with a, a caring individual or a counselor therapist. You know, really when somebody is in that dire need, uh, no intervention is, you know, not needed, if you will. You know, we just need to help that individual the best way we can. So this kind of takes you through the steps of how to help someone um, in, in a really tough situation, if you will. And then a lot of times, like I said, uh, counselors and therapists will use something similar to help somebody in that time frame. Okay. And then if you do get a chance to get an appointment for, um, you know, any type of counseling or um, other crisis work or ceremony or, or whatnot, you know, there's room here to help remind you of when those appointments are, because sometimes we forget those, those things when we're in such a crisis state, we forget what we, what we're supposed to do, even though we know we want to do that. The next one here is really important as well. Lastly, is our phone apps. You know, we all have those devices on our, in our person, you know, somewhere, some of us have more than one. And these things uh, in the sense of apps can be downloaded. And it's really important because sometimes if you, if you just want to learn the skills so you can practice them on your own, you know, these, uh, I've looked at both, of them, not both of them, all of them really for the most part, and they do offer some really great tips as well. And New Mexico also has their crisis line, everything connected on their phone. So uh, as an app that is. And so I think those are very important just to point out because you know, we wanna do whatever we can to help us make sure we're taking care of ourselves. And this is the CDC and that's really helpful too because even as guidelines change, uh, you know, we talked about quarantine, isolation, testing, even now those are getting vaccinated, booster or the shots, you know, it, it sometimes changes how we look at our testing and our isolation and our quarantine times. And so downloading apps like these such as CDC are very helpful as well if, if just to help be informed. And these are things that we're noticing um, across the board, IHS 638, CBMHS, other helping um, resources that are shown here, you know, the high rates of stress, you know, related to the things that have been talked about, you know, during these fireside conversations. Anxiety, and sometimes this is, can be a natural feeling as well, and being anxious about certain things. Like if you're not a, um, wanting to be in front of people and talking like we are doing during these uh, presentations, you know, you may feel anxious about those things. And so these are the ways, you know, just tips again of how to cope with that because it can go hand in hand, being stressed and having these anxious feelings or thoughts of worry being nervous or just not, not thinking you can get through certain situations. Okay, and the other things we have on the web pages uh, within Department of Health under mental health resources are things such as this. For grief, you know, we unfortunately have faced this a lot on the nation uh, due to, you know, before the vaccinations and the shots and even afterwards now, you know, there's grief going on in different ways and shapes and forms. And a lot of us are reaching out in some ways for our spirituality, uh, to our own belief systems. Uh, could be, you know, a traditional, could be faith-based. It could be a lot of other things and, and what we do. And so again, just finding ways that we can cope, make sure that we're taking care of ourselves again, phone numbers that are there. So I just wanted to share that because it really is something that overall Navajo, we're the largest land-based nation, native nation, and we want to make sure that all our people have a resource. And so please, if you want to uh, print this out, you know, for your family, for your friends, or, you know, save it, bookmark it on your device, you know, I really think it can be helpful. And sometimes it's just, you know, you don't always think you're going to need it. <laughs> but then when you want it, you, you're kind of trying to shuffle around and figure out where, where is it. Uh, but I, I do encourage all of us to, you know, take that time like uh, First Lady and Second Lady pointed out, you know, there's reasons why we feel a certain way and react a certain way to things. So really finding the supports when something is not in your normal range of how you behave or how you think or anything like that. These are just resources we can all use to help us during this time. So I just wanted to share that as well as, as an, an, an just appreciation for all the the presentations, I think, that have been very enlightening. 
So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Um, Benzer, my, uh, from Navajo Division of Behavioral and Mental Health Services, Navajo, uh, Navajo Department of Health for providing the information for the Navajo people. Yeah. Um, na kuna e Dr. Marilyn Zimmerman, Jay um, Lee National Native Children's Trauma Center, just she's the lead. The center is a partner to with us at the KC, and she is going to be our primary presenter of the information. She is also joined by her team who will be um, viewing the chat and also responding to the chats. Dr. Zimmerman. Thank you, Thomas. Actually, I won't be doing the bulk of the training. We have uh -huh. <laughs> we have some exceptional trainers, and so they have opportunity to share this uh, this afternoon. I, as Thomas said, I'm Dr. Marilyn Brewer Zimmerman. I'm a citizen of the uh, Nakona and Dakota people who reside on the Fort Peck Assiniboine Sioux Reservation in Montana. I currently serve as a senior director of policy and programs at the National Native Children's Trauma Center. I'm the mother of four and the grandmother of four. Kimmy, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Kimmy Wind Hummingbird, I'm Muskogee, and I'm joining you today from my reservation in Oklahoma. Um, Excited to be a part of the team. I am a mother to three beautiful young women and a daughter or a grandmother to two Kiki, two little babies that I'm their Kiki. So, so excited to be here. Lots of good conversation today about faith, belief, hope, and resilience. Um, Veronica? Veronica, <laughs> I'm Veronica Willetto D. Crane. Um, I am Dene, um, and I grew up in a Hohenzino area on the eastern um, edge of um, Navajo, and I currently live in Billings, Montana, um, with my family up here, and I have five children um, and my husband um, who is um, part of the Crow tribe. And so I'm just excited to be talking today about this topic. Um, it's been really great to hear from um, the first lady and second lady, um, their thoughts on this topic and for um, starting us off in a good way. Um, so I'm just grateful to be here and excited to get started. Great. Next slide, Veronica. So just very bri briefly, why are, we're putting resilient, thinking about this in the framework of resilience. It's, so it's really, we have very unique ways uh, of how we seek out he spiritual healing, physical healing, emotional, psychological healing. And so we really just want to encourage everyone to lean into whatever their um, preferred method of connecting with the universe is. Um, it also really we want to shift the narrative to more strength based. So it's about building our resilience. It's about faith, hope, uh, belief, and resiliency. And it asks the right question, what is strong about you? So as you listen to this, start thinking about some of the strengths, so some of the ways that you've overcome adversity, some of the ways that you continue to uh, be resilient in your life and in your family and in your community. Next slide. I won't go over this. Dr. Uh, Branzer did a great job talking about the local resources that include all of this. So we'll go to the next slide. So before beginning, I, I invite you to reflect a little bit. So how do you know that, how do you know that you would describe as having faith or, or who, I mean, who do you know? So we have, we, we, there are those people that are in the community that are all, that are well known to be spiritual teachers and leaders um, and cultural teachers and leaders and pastors and priests and lay people who are known for their faith and their hope. So think about who they might be and think about um, how do you think their faith or sense of hope contributes to their resilience? And so we'll, we'll move on now to get some examples. Next slide, Veronica. All right, so I'm gonna get us started um, by talking about faith, 
and belief and the connection of these two things to our well being. So let's begin by asking ourselves um, what is faith? Um, maybe you have your own understanding of what faith is to you, um, how you would describe it, um, <clears throat> how you see it in your life. But these are just some examples of some ways that we can define faith. Um, faith can be a strong belief or trust um, that a person has in someone or something. Um, it can also be the belief in the existence of God or of a higher power or powers. It can also be having strong religious feelings or belief. Um, and then it could also be a system of religious beliefs, being a part of a system of religious beliefs. So spirituality <clears throat> is a personal experience. And as we just described, um, there can be very different types of definitions and different ways that people um, live out their spirituality. And it can be seen as an inner belief system providing an individual with meaning and purpose in life. Um, it can be viewed as a sense of the sacredness of life and a vision for the betterment of the world. And then there are other definitions that emphasize a connection to that which transcends the self. Um, so that connection might be to God, a higher power, a universal energy, the sacred, or to nature. So essentially, um, how we're going to talk about it in this conversation is that um, spirituality is essentially our faith and belief system. And researchers have identified three dimensions for thinking about a person's spirituality. Um, it can involve um, a person's beliefs, a person's spiritual practices, and then a person's spiritual experiences. Religion, um, on the other hand, is the community level engagement with structured beliefs and rituals. So this is essentially maybe how we would understand a faith community. And many individuals would describe their faith or faith community as the most important source of strength and direction for their lives. Yet spirituality can also be an area in a person's life that is undeveloped or unexplored. There are also times when individuals have experienced trauma related to faith or to faith communities. So it can be associated with hurtful experiences. Our spirituality impacts our sense of identity as well as our worldview, meaning that it affects how we see others and ourselves and who we are, as well as how we see the world and our relationship to the world. And because spirituality plays such a significant and central role in the lives of many people, it is likely to be affected by trauma and affect a person's reaction to trauma. So for this reason, faith can be a critical part of our holistic care, as well as our holistic self-care. So research tells us that trauma can produce both positive and negative effects on the spiritual experiences and perceptions that people have. So people can begin to have spiritual questions. And sometimes this can be seen as having an existential crisis where a person can begin to question. Maybe they start to question the nature or character of their higher power, or they could start to question the nature of human beings. Um, they could question the spiritual or religious community that they're a part of. Um, they could also question the meaning of life uh, and their spiritual or religious beliefs. So with this questioning, um, with this 
impact that trauma is having on their spirituality, this can lead um, to positive effects, such as a person having a spiritual awakening or a person having a spiritual evolution. But it could also lead to negative impacts, like a person losing their sense of purpose, um, lacking, um, feeling a lack of self-satisfaction or hopelessness, or they could even be angry with their higher power. For children specifically, one researcher says that traumatic experiences function as a kind of reverse religious experience for them, where it threatens their core meaningfulness, the core meaningfulness um, that they have um, around their spirituality. Research shows that survivors of childhood violence change their original spiritual practices by either denouncing religion altogether, changing their faith, or turning to a more personal form of spiritual practice. And what I mean by that is, for example, if there was a child named Sarah, and Sarah experienced this violence within her faith community, and it caused her to believe that her faith community will not protect her and that she has to take measures to protect herself. And so what she'll end up, maybe what she'll end up doing, um, what Sarah will end up doing is she'll start to practice her spirituality apart from her faith community. So all of these effects that trauma can have, um, these spiritual impacts um, that trauma can have, um, they can, um, lessen over time, um, especially if a person um, gets help um, when they need it. And there are common reactions that people who are suffering from uh, trauma can have. Um, so in previous sessions, we've mentioned some of these things of some impacts like emotional, physical, mental, or behavioral reactions that people can have to trauma. And these reactions can happen immediately after their trauma experience, or it can be more of a delayed reaction. For instance, a person might experience trauma in their childhood and not begin to have reactions until maybe they're a teenager or they're an adult. But these um, are common spiritual or you might even call them existential reactions that a person can have to trauma. So in the immediate, a person could begin to practice a very intense prayer. Um, they could um, immediately restore their faith in the goodness of others, especially um, during their um, difficult experience. Maybe they, they have help from other people and so it restores their faith in the goodness of others. Um, they could lose um, self-efficacy. They could um, become, um, have a feeling of despair about humanity, um, especially if the experience that they had, um, maybe they were harmed intentionally by another person. So it was an intentional trauma that they experienced. And they could also have immediate disruption of life assumptions. So maybe they had certain assumptions about life, like fairness, um, how fair life is, or how safe life is, or how good it is, or how predictable their life, their life is. So they can start to have some um, disruption to this type of uh, view of their lives. And then some more delayed reactions. Um, you know, the, the first one we talked about questioning. Um, one of the other questions that um, people may have who are struggling with trauma is they begin to ask, you know, why me? Um, they could also um, have increased feelings of cynicism and disillusionment, um, but they could also just have an increased self-confidence. So they could think, you know, if I can survive this, I can survive anything. Um, they could also lose, um, as I mentioned before, um, a sense of purpose in their life. They could um, have renewed faith. Um, they could um, become hopeless. Um, they could reestablish 
the priorities that they have in life and they start to realize that there's certain things that are really important to them. And so they'll begin to prioritize those things. Um, they could redefine the meaning and importance of their life. Um, they may look at their life and just realize that time is short and really realize how important it is to live every day out. Um, they could rework their life assumptions um, to accommodate the trauma. For example, um, they might start taking a self-defense class to start to reestablish that feeling of safety that they had before. So a person might not have all of those reactions and they might not have any of these reactions after a trauma. Um, it just depends, each person is different. And when a person is impacted negatively <clears throat> in a spiritual way by trauma, there's a possibility that it alters their belief system. So since spirituality shapes our sense of identity, a traumatic experience can cause a person to believe that they are not good enough, smart enough, smart enough, or worthy enough. For example, um, let's say there's a person named Tom, and Tom was in a car with his parents when they got into an accident. And unfortunately, in that accident, his mom passed away. He could begin to believe that he's a horrible person because he didn't save his mom's life. And then spirituality also shapes our worldview. So when trauma happens, this can lead to a person believing um, that the world is a dangerous place and that things will never get better. So for example, um, let's say there's a, a young girl named Susan who is severely bullied and she doesn't feel like anyone is going to rescue her from all of the bullying that she is going through through. So she begins to believe that all people are mean, um, that they're not safe and they can't be trusted. And then she feels like in order to protect herself, that she has to be mean to them first. Um, so that's, um, or else they'll find a way to hurt her. So that's kind of ways in which um, trauma can impact our belief system about ourselves um, and how we see ourselves, but also about the world around them. There are also some barriers to healing that individuals with trauma history may struggle with. So um, in some faiths, um, there's a focus on forgiveness. Uh, probably in many faiths, there's a focus on forgiveness. Um, and sometimes, um, Instead of focusing on the perpetrators of trauma um, and um, expecting them to atone for their actions, there becomes this pressure on the victims for them to forgive um, their perpetrators. And then um, sometimes um, within our faith communities, we might send the message that if you don't forgive, you're not a good person. Or, um, you know, we fail to send the message that forgiveness is a journey and only one component of the recovery process and that there's other things um, that a person struggling with trauma can, um, may have to go through before they can reach forgiveness, such as mourning, um, dealing with their shame, and then acknowledging um, that their anger is justified. Another barrier is a mental health as an indication of one's level of faith. So in their faith, um, they may get the message that if you have enough faith, you wouldn't be depressed, you know, you wouldn't be struggling with these mental health issues. Instead of um, learning that faith helps a person get through these mental health challenges, and that a person of faith can still have these types of mental health challenges. And then another barrier is self-blame. So one example of this is um, the idea that you reap what you sow. So in our faith, we might be taught that you reap what you sow. So a person who thinks she has to forgive herself, uh, maybe for her caregiver molesting her, 
um, that can that can be an example of a person who starts to blame herself because of this type of teaching. Um, but we must be careful that um, you know we let people who are struggling with trauma, these traumatic experiences, know that whether they're an adult or a child, that they're not to be blamed for what happened to them for the abuse and that they're not responsible for having gone through it. And then another barrier that can occur is with the teaching of sexual purity. So there's a lot of teachings on um, being sexually pure within different types of faith. Um, and this can cause a person who's been through a, um, a sex related um, trauma that they, they begin to feel that they're unworthy. So for example, if a person who has been raped uh, feels unworthy or unclean or unaccepted because they were raped. And then another barrier is just devaluing women. Um, sometimes we may get this message within our faith, um, different types of faiths um, that women are seducers. Um, so we just have to be careful about that kind of um, messages around sexism. And then shame um, is another barrier. And so a victim of sexual trauma sometimes is questioned and undermined. Um, and then that causes them to feel shame about what happened to them. And then of course, just the justification of abuse. Um, so we really have to think critically and question some of the justification, the messages that we may get that justify abuse um, within our faith communities. Um, so an example of, of a abuse that is done by a religious person, um, I know that this is something that, um, you know, in, in our tribal communities, um, people struggle with is just the um, experience of a religious leader or a religious person who um, abuses children. So they may do this emotionally, verbally, physically, or sexually. And sometimes these children are told that they have to comply or they will be a disappointment to God. So this causes breaking of trust in the religious institution and the leaders um, and in, even in God and leads to the children experiencing um, greater negative effects on their long-term well-being uh, because the very thing that would have been a source of healing for them, they struggle to place their trust in. So that's just an example of what can happen when we justify or um, not hold um, perpetrators responsible. So I've talked a little bit about the negative impacts, <clears throat> spiritual impacts that trauma can have, but now I want to talk a little bit about um, faith and how it can help with our well-being. So I mentioned earlier that there can be positive um, impacts uh, on our faith and on our spirituality, um, even when we go through trauma. And that in general, faith can just really help us with our well-being overall. Um, so research finds that practicing faith actually promotes resilience in the face of various difficulties. So for example, if people are struggling with community violence, um, abuse, um, may and partner violence can relate on their faith um, to really get through, through those difficult times. And practicing faith has also been found to have a positive relationship with health promoting behaviors. So for example, a person, because of their teachings in their faith, they may refrain from um, engaging in drugs and alcohol. Um, maybe ought to keep their bodies pure and so maybe uh, and to take care of their bodies and so um, they may um, exercise or have a healthy um, some of that lead to good health. Another um, thing that reminds that um, helps us with um, just being when people are struggling with depression their faith can actually buffer against the symptoms uh, of depression that they're going through. 
And the research also tells us that religious forms of coping to deal with difficult things. So for example, child have found faith to be important to their survival and recovery and their faith becomes a resource. It becomes a way for them to make meaning of their So our faith and faith community for positive um, coping and self-care. So we can share different examples of examples of you in your own life. Some examples of things that we can do in the moment. Um, pray. Um, you know, prayer is a connection to your higher power, to God. Uh, and Veronica? Veronica? Yes. I apologize. You might want to shut your video off. You're kind of cutting in and out a little bit. So. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, is that better? Much better. Yes. Okay. Okay. I have some internet struggles right now. <clears throat> well, thanks, Kimmy. All right, uh, what I was mentioning is just positive um, coping or related to our faith. So um, engaging in prayer, practicing, um, and how prayer is that direct connection to your higher, to Jesus. So you could practice prayer. You could also um Read or listen to um, inspirational music and maybe or video. Um, you could also uh, practice gratitude in the moment, especially really strong, the difficult time. trying to see at least one thing that you're grateful for. The long um, what is meaningful to you and notice its place in your life. Uh, find a spiritual connection if you don't already have one. Find a faith community uh, if you have one. And also um, for those especially who struggle with maybe some trauma and they can come that did them. And um, they could get guidance from a faith leader, a mentor, or um, you could also seek out faith-based counseling and support group no. to others and is really central and core. Engaging in that type of activity can really help you as well uh, when you're going through a difficult time. So we can also learn teaching us have a positive sense of self-identity and a bold view. Uh, you know, if we, uh, if there's a person who is a survivor of violence, um, maybe the belief that there is someone who believes them and who loves them despite what they've gone through, or they might have a belief that the perpetrators, those that um, caused violence to them will have to answer to a higher power for their actions. Even if maybe, for example, they, they never are held accountable um, by the courts. And finally, um, I just want to share that um, one of the areas that is really helpful, one of the factors that contributes to positive effects of faith um, include having the social support of a faith community. Uh, so in one research that I want to highlight, I thought this was really cool. Um, it's a randomly selected sample of 143 public school youth ages 11 to 13. And what they found was that mothers that participated in a faith community um, actually helped to stabilize their family and gave the mother as well as their children the support that they needed. 
So what ended up happening for these mothers is that they ended up having greater overall life satisfaction. They were more involved with their family and they had better skills for solving their health related problems, all from being a part of a faith community. So I will end with that and I'll pass it over to Kimmy, who's gonna to talk to us about hope. Thanks, Veronica. Okay, um, next slide. Hope is a psychological strength associated with many positive outcomes, including greater happiness and better academic achievement and an empower or even a lowered risk of death. If you're if you have a lot of hope within you, um, it really changes your mindset, your outlook on, on um, your current situation. It's a necessary ingredient, ingredient for getting through tough times, but also for meeting everyday goals, as noted here by the American Psychological Association. When challenged by a crisis, less hopeful people tend to shut down. Hopeful people are more likely to take action to help them come, cope. They firmly believe that they have the will and the ability to obtain any outcome they want. Dr. Charles Snyder, a psychologist at the University of Kansas, developed a model of hope that has three components, goals, agency, and pathways. He views agency as our ability to, ability to shape our lives, the belief that we can make things happen, and the motivation to reach a desired outcome. Pathways are how we get there the roots and plans that allow us to achieve the goal, whether that's making the team, completing high school, or maybe finding that dream job. Next slide, please. Our thoughts, behaviors, and emotions are all connected. If we alter one, we can alter the other two. For example, let's say you saved up enough money to finally buy that car you need to get back and forth to work, and shortly thereafter, it breaks down. After this happens, you might think, I worked so hard for this and at a job that I'm trying to get out of and needed this car to get a new, better paying job. I saved so long for this and now it broke down. There's no point in trying to get a better job. I can't even get there, I'm stuck. These thoughts are likely to set the tone for your overall outlook on your current situation. You might be frustrated and you might be unable to hide your frustration, resulting in rude or impatient behavior with you, with your family, your friends, and even with yourself. You might do what you can to avoid thinking about what's going on. Ultimately, this may make you feel worthless in your situation and discouraged about your future for lack of the ability to get a better job. It's possible to change this picture by altering your initial thoughts. Rather than viewing it as hopeless, you could focus on its positive elements. I still have a job when so many others don't. Yes, I ran into a problem, but maybe it's an easy fix. I have Auntie Lily who works on cars and she could take a look at it for me and maybe, maybe it won't be so as expensive as I think it might be. If you decide to take the attitude of this is just a bump in the road, I know I'll get past it. Just like I saved up for the car, I can save up to fix whatever it is. Maybe it won't take much more money. By reframing your thoughts in this way, you're likely to alter your behavior and emotions. You might begin to feel hopeful about your future job or your goals. And I'm gonna pass it over to Marilyn to talk a little bit more about this. Next slide, please. Thanks, Kimmy. So really, um, the first examples that Kimmy gave is really these cognitive distortions that we can have um, that really, um, they don't lead, lend to being hopeful. So there's this polarized thinking, which is very black and white. Um, it's all or nothing. It's, uh, it's, all, it's gonna be marvelous or it's gonna be the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Um, I'm going to be, we're gonna have the best marriage or we want a divorce because after one fight, that sort of thing. It's lots of overgeneralizing. Um, so you might have a bad relationship. And so you get out of that bad relationship and you, you overgeneralize to say all men or all women, you know, are hurtful. Um, and you don't think you'll ever have a decent, um, relationship again. I'm going to, you, or you could personalize it. Personalizing it is like, it's my fault. You know, it's, I should have been there. It's my fault. It wouldn't happen if I would have been there. And that personalization can come in a faith community as in, my I, perfect example is my mother-in-law. My husband, when he was in high school, got in a very, very bad car accident. And she was convinced it was because it was the one night that she didn't worry 
And the one night she didn't say prayers for him. So she personalized that. And it really was about his choices. Um, I'm going to skip a few. Um, the shoulds and the ought statements that we can rely on, they should know better. Um, he, well, if he if he loved me, he ought to quit drinking. Um, if uh, they cared about me, they should visit more often or those, it's, they're unhelpful or labeling is probably one of the other most unhelpful instead of giving a chance for hope. Here's another story. I had worked with a colleague, um, uh, older male colleague. We had to work with a tribal leader who uh, was known to be, uh, to have been married many times and they never worked out because he, uh, he was very violent. And so we have a, but he was an elect, became an elected official. And we get back from that reservation. And my colleague said, he's a bad guy. And I said, no, he's not a bad guy. He's just experienced a lot of trauma. Well, how do you, why don't you, and I said, because if we call him bad or a drunk or a perpetrator, right? Using certain kinds of language, it really removes the opportunity for change and growth and really subdues the idea of having hope for that person in their life and or having hope for yourself in your own life. Next slide. Um, we can make several adjustments to our perspective that may help us have a better outlook. First, we should strive to maintain an awareness, both of the present both in the present moment by becoming aware of your body and your thoughts and of the larger context by keeping the bigger picture in mind. This allows us to draw on our empathetic responses while helping us to avoid being caught up in the intensity of our current situation or responding without sufficient forethought. Another adjustment of perspective might be to help us protect ourselves is to accept our own limitations and knowing when to seek out support or assistance like calling Auntie Lily to help with the car. By accepting our limitations and the difficulties we face, this can help us avoid wishful thinking and unnecessary self-criticism. It can free us up to focus on changing what can be changed rather than focusing on problems that can't be solved. A third change we can make in our perspective is to focus on the process of our goal more so than the outcomes. While we should do everything in our power to bring about positive outcomes for ourselves and our communities, we need to understand that for traumatized children and families, healing and stability may require a great deal of time and effort, and successes may not always be absolute. We can control our daily interactions and behaviors if we focus on making these the best they can be and avoid dwelling on the negative or on outcomes that are out of our control we will be better able to cultivate hope. Next slide, please. Optimism can be considered your mental attitude or your outlook. It can allow you to have an expectation of the best possible outcome for any situation. Optimists are considered to be your silver lining or glass half full people. As you can see, while there, oh, for those of you who can't see, there's a diagram up on um, the PowerPoint that is going to outline what I'm what I'm visiting that about. Um, there are many things our jobs in our jobs that we don't have control over. We do have the capacity to intervene in the thought, behavior, and emotional cycle by focusing on the positive. This may feel like a difficult challenge, thinking optimistically in a situation that seems intensely negative. Most of it, most of us find it easier to identify what's going wrong than what's going right, especially when as in our work, there are so many obvious things that go wrong. However, optimism can be learned if we develop the habit of reframing our negative or unhelpful thoughts with positive or helpful thoughts, we will be able to bring an optimism to our work that not only helps us cope with it, with its many demands, but also helps our clients achieve better outcomes. Next slide, please. Creating hope for stronger families. Um, ways to achieve that can include spending time together, um, taking their health and safety into consideration, caring about and for one another, sharing values, promoting personal growth, um, honoring each other's differences, and so a supportive family consists of people who spend time together, who know one another's personalities and concerns, they care about each other, 
and share a common value system and promote personal growth through connection to others. So I'm gonna hand it over to Marilyn really quickly to talk about uh, stronger communities. Sure. So there are some, there's some channels, uh, challenges, challenges to uh, um, building stronger communities. And I think that that's a really important conversation to have, especially uh, as we have a uh, first lady and the second lady here with us. And knowing that through the political process, the, the challenges, challenges to re really restoring the well-being of our families, um, of our of individuals, families, and our communities. So there have there is uh, there can be many challenges in it to community building much stronger communities, and that is very much a lack of disempowerment of com or community ownership. So you you may notice that some communities on Navajo seem to be more robust and healthier than other communities. And it could be that there's disinvestment in the ones that aren't as doing as well. There's this historical uh, community dis uh, d disinvestment, like no, one's, no one wants to move there, live there, work there, that sort of thing. Uh, there's distrust and disconnection with the services and the, and the institutions that are meant and built to support. There's instability, unreliability, and inconsistency um, in the services. People also really don't want to be treated like consumers. They would rather be treated like partners, but it's very difficult to treat them as partners when they have come to believe that the community um, that the community institutions aren't there for them, that they are lacking in good support, you know, a poor school district, a poor uh, healthcare access, that sort of thing. So how do we do this? How do we build hope? Um, first, we think about doing no harm. First, we think about in this community development, how do we help folks where they're at and accept community members where they're at? And so, at, in order to build community empowerment. And when we accept people where they're at, they make the changes, they make the decisions about how they wanna change. And then thinking about it in a very reflective process, really thinking about how can we do better next time? How can I do better in the next, in the next meeting, the next uh, gathering, the next family event, whatever that can look like. Next slide, please. All right. Moving on to faith, hope, and resilience. Apologize, y'all. We're going to go a little bit over. Um, next slide, please. In the other um, in the other uh, presentations, you we had some uh, definitions of resilience. So we invite you to go back to those presentations and look at uh, some of the resilience slides. So one of the ways that we wanted to look at resilience today is thinking about the concept of forgiveness and its impact on our well-being, its impact on our individual well-being and, and our relationships and on our community. So uh, forgiveness is being defined as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or re vengeance toward a person or a group who's harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. That's the key, right? Do they deserve it? Nobody deserves forgiveness. Everybody needs forgiveness, right? Next slide. So here's a question. Do I really need to forgive in order to heal? I And many of us have known many stories where people who are physically ill uh, moved into some sort of place of forgiveness with someone who had hurt them in their past, and it opened the gateway for uh, for them to be able to get some sort of relief from their physical pain or their physical illness or her, um, or injury. So yes, not just to heal spiritually or emotionally, but even to heal physically, we do need to forgive to heal. Next slide. So here's what forgiveness doesn't mean, right? We really want to make this clear. It is a decision, right? But you're not letting people off the hook. The people that have hurt you in the past, whether it was a sexual abuse abuser, whether it's an ex-husband, whether it's an old boss, you're not letting them off the hook by forgiving. Forgiveness is about you and your pathway to health and to healing and to hope and to faith, right? So it's not about letting them off the hook. And it's not about whether or not justice is done. They, you know, was that sexual 
abuser ever arrested, ever convicted? Did they ever spend, go to prison? Um, did, did you get the land back uh, like you were supposed to because you know that, that person, your relative um, conned you out of or conned other people out of your land? Nope, you didn't get your land back. Justice has really not been done, but that's still, you can still forgive even if it hasn't been done. Um, you don't have to forget the past. That doesn't mean that you have to say, oh yeah, no, for, forgive and forget is a saying that should never have come up in our, uh, in our uh, conversation, in our cultural way of being in the world. Um, it, we, we can remember the past and still give forgiveness. And there's absolutely going to be times after you've made that quality decision to forgive, you might have to say it a thousand times, in the next year, I forgive, I forgive, I forgive you. Every time you think of the person or the situation, right? You say, I forgive. That doesn't mean that those feelings won't come back and, and, and hurt, right? That, and it doesn't mean that you haven't forgiven. Dis forgiveness is a decision. Next slide, please. So what does it mean to forgive, right? Well, just uh, this first line uh, is just really wanting to say, though this work of forgiveness, this spiritual work of forgiveness um, is not for the weak or faint of heart. And it's not easy, but it is so worth it. So by letting go of your hurt and your pain or your bitterness uh, means that you view your, the, your view about yourself as the wrong one or the victim. That's how you enter the world. You enter as a victim. You know, you, you enter as the victim of whatever circumstances, the victim of an individual, the victim of a system. And when you begin to let go of all that pain and hurt, you change your identity. You're no longer the victim. You see your own role in it, right? So it might even be just this role. It's sort of like, you know, you, you hurt me once, shame on you. You hurt me twice, shame on me. Like I knew better. Right. I knew, but I pushed all that aside and I got hurt again. So that's, you know, I didn't look at reality. I didn't look at um, what had happened in the past and the patterns. I just chose to just move foolishly forward, um, not thinking. Um, we give away our responsibility for the behaviors of another. You know, how, how our ex's, ex husband behaves. Uh, in his family or his community is none of our business. How people think about us and view us is none of our business, right? Our role is to just be in the world and do the best we can and stay connected both physically and culturally and spiritually. And you might have uh, this thing, but if he really loved me, if he or she really loved me, they would, listen, you're enough. You know, leave the behaviors and consequences at the feet of the person you want to forgive. It's not about whether or not they loved you, right? You are lovable. You are enough. You're all right. It's about how they chose to be in the world. And it might be that they're, you know, negotiating the world in their own trauma. Finally, forgiving ourselves too. It's sort of like I should have known better. Well, maybe, but you got to let some of that stuff go. I, I know that sometimes uh, when I'm training in the impacts of trauma on child development, I will, all, I will always have a parent raise their hand and say, so I didn't know then what I, you know, what I know now. So what am I supposed to do now that they're adults? And, uh, you know, you got to let yourself off the hook. You got to forgive yourself. When we know better, we do better, right? And as soon as we do know better and we do better, that's a part of restoring ourselves to our community, to, to our, to our self, to our higher power and to our community. Next slide. What if I choose not to forgive? Is it, there's an option, but there are consequences if you choose not to forgive. We know that there are health consequences. There's that toxic memories um, lead to feelings of anger, bitterness, anxiety. Um, and we, when we have those feelings, when we have those memories, we have those feelings and they release stress hormones and it, and it really elevates our risk of heart disease and diabetes or addiction. 
Uh, spiritually, it blocks us from being healed in our body and mind, not just our spirit. I already said, mentioned that. And it cuts us off from emotions. So if we cut ourselves off from, um, from emotions or uh, we don't begin to feel like if we're always in bitterness and anger or anxiety, um, we cannot open ourselves up to the opportunity to feel the emotions of gratitude or joy or peace, right? And having some kind of hope. The burden of unforgiveness is really heavy, right? It's really heavy. And it can go on to impact our relationships with our families, with our creator, with our environment, with the land. Um, and it's toxic for all of us. Next slide, please. How do we spiritually heal? Uh, so you may become involved in your, if you have a religion, the rituals and the and the uh, the rituals that bring some sort of peace. You could do uh, meditation, connect with nature, laughter therapy, which I think uh, uh, indigenous people have a real corner on because we love to laugh. Um, we love to laugh at ourselves. Um, exercise is good. Sleep therapy. And practicing an attitude of gratitude, you know, that it's pretty hard sometimes, but I am so grateful that I have a job still that I can make a living during COVID, right? I get to stay at home because I have, I'm at high risk. So I'm so grateful for that. That's just one thing, thinking about one thing to be grateful for every day. Next slide. So let us know how has faith and hope strengthened your families and communities? And can I see the next slide, uh, Veronica? Is it the closing? Okay, great. Let's, so let's go back one more. All right. If anybody is interested, we're gonna allow time for people to make comments uh, about the information they've heard, about how some memories were triggered when that, you know, you remember prayers being answered or, restoration happening or healing happening. So please um, feel free to unmute or raise your hand or type in chat. And I invite the first lady and the second lady to make comments also. Perhaps everybody's uh, stepped away. Let's let's uh, Maybe. go to. The oh yes. <laughs> oh, oh, means okay. Um, I think First Lady uh, would like to um, make a comment. Okay, great. Please. Let's do it. There she is. Okay. Yeah, Dave, thank you for staying online with all of us. Yes. <laughs> thank you for all the presenters and everything that you've shared with us. Um, this is the fourth session and you know, there's been a lot that's been shared, um, you know, two sessions in December, and then this is the second session in January. And it is a lot to take in, a lot to think about. But for families, you know, I hope that you realize, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, even the, before the pandemic, trauma as a whole was being studied. And that's where you, they brought in the pieces on historical trauma and how that really gets into the core of our DNA even, and really, you know, it exists there. But also there's, you know, that's half the story. Then the other part is there's also strength in our DNA. And when, you know, we, we have to always uh, remember that. And then also going through, you know, how it impacts our lives. How does it play out in our lives? The way we think, the way we feel, the way we 
view even our lives and everything that goes on around us. And so really when it gets to building resilience and then, and then with this session on faith, belief, and hope, we're talking about um, what is it that grounds us when, you know, trials and challenges come into our lives. And right now everybody's been in the current pandemic and, and I'm, you know, all of us are at probably at that point of wondering when or if things will ever go back to how they used to be. And we're just being patient and kind of going along day to day, week to week. And, you know, it, it, you see this play out in the schools, you see it play out in the workplaces, and then you see how it has impacted um, our households. You know, there's so many families uh, that have been impacted by it through, you know, whether it's the loss of relatives, family members, you see it in the loss of employment, maybe uh, you see it in just the dynamics of home life, children going to school from home. And then of course, dealing with internet issues, uh, you know, even access to electricity, water, you know, a, a lot of things have just been elevated during this time. And for Native peoples, I always think, you know, it's especially here on Navajo, we've seen all the struggles that uh, people have had to endure since um, two years ago now. And so it's been a long, a long while, um, but we just wanted to bring and bring you these sessions to really start thinking about, you know, the in times like this, you come back to yourself and what it is that you hold true about your own life. How do you view yourself? How do you want? And for us mothers, you know, I have two children here in the house with me. And, you know, we have to always model, we have to learn these skills and to model it for them. And I always have these conversations with them, you know in their lifetime, this might not be the only pandemic. And so for our children and our grandchildren looking into the future, we want to show them that we, we get through hard times such as this and that we want to be able to share with them. Uh, to, you know, we want them to, to teach them and to model for them that when, as they go through these experiences with us, that they'll carry on those teachings and those experiences as well. So then later on, they can share those stories with their own children and their grandchildren as well. So a lot of this is not just, um, I know we're telling everybody to kind of go back to being in the moment and making mm -hmm. sure you're getting all the little things done every single day, like getting enough sleep, drinking water, uh, making sure you get exercise in there and really just, um, stay focused on the positive things and to really uh, do that. But in the long run, it, it's good. And it, it's really to build up hope and just to remind our people that, you know, this is, this is just another, another one of those challenges that we're going to, that we're going through together and we'll get through it. And so um, thank you again for, the partners who presented all of this and um, it is it's very good information because trauma can come from a variety of things and everybody um, is impacted by by these things differently and so how they process it and how um, what will work for one person may may look different uh, um, for somebody else so just give each other time and space and let we just have to we're trying to just give you certain things to think about and certain skills and certain, um, certain just, just little tools that you can use every single day for yourself and then for, for your families as well. So thank you again for listening. And of course, um, from the Office of First Lady and Second Lady and then Office of President, Vice President, we pray for all the families. So every single, every single day, every single week, you are being preyed upon you and your household. So thank you again, Akihat. Thank you, First Lady, <laughs> thank you. Um, so Thomas, are you do, doing the closing prayer? I, 
at jeg har um, så s- 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 det um, også det er first lady the for your comments og der er ikke noget frage i jeg har der vi sager jo de en kaban så har kæst the office of the president or vice president og en har jeg han jeg så kæst i kalet an hitten ne de ben ne bedre bedre har de kan covid har nogen dags ni og der ni ikke en der og ikke der kunne ne kunne ne bedre de ni så ni ikke bare der har chang jo ei der ni ikke der har de i der ni der ni ikke der den der og kan ei sin ben jeg der ne og der ei um kan der ei som er lola ei ni ikke så der der ni ikke der ikke han ei der en ei der lige som er Ach ja, so die in Lini gar gute. Und dann auch ist ein Zadot da, da nicht hat Ego neben Kiddischchen, kommt das hat da schon nach der Tee. Aber die hat das Tee, da hat das Zadot da, ich sehe gute. Jeder ich drei, ich dort da, ich habe schon je, je, und dann finde ich mich auch. Na so, da hat die Zähne bin, die ich nicht schreiben, je, und sie hat nicht die in Lini gar, und dann war da eine. Wato chanan susli hanya tahu tega kode. Bila ini kasa aku, saya hat seni do lesti do sosial chan apa. Kesi isal seni do kesi kau jadi tanizat apa. Bila aku kau hone, arah bila aku ti kalau aku hot ego pensil kau hone aku. Jadi ego ya tu itu ansa jadi ini ni kau dah nak di dalam kita Jesus. Kau saya hat seni do sosial chan ada. Jono nak susun kas data juga, ada konten di sini, ada konten itu dah istimewa itu. Kita hendak tahu definisinya. Kita akan lihat tu sedikit ni kan, kau siapa tu? Ini satu tu. Ini sebenar tu ada tu. Ini sebenar. Thank you. Yeah, we'll turn it back over to Sonia, and don't forget to download the Office of the First Lady's app. Sonia. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you to everyone. Thank you to our presenters from the National Native uh, Center, the National Native Center for Children's Trauma. Thank you. Um, again, uh, we encourage you all to download the Navajo Nation Office of the First Lady and Second Lady app, uh, which is available on the Apple Play, Apple Store as well as the Google Play Store. You may search Navajo Nation Office of the First Lady and it should be um, the first or second app that shows up. Um, and this, this is a good way to stay connected with our office and get the latest information um, on our events as well as community events. So thank you again for joining us. And if you need to rewatch any of the sessions, uh, those will be available at the Navajo Nation OPVP Communications YouTube channel. Thank you again, Ekeha. Thanks everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs>